Welcome. So today I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview on uh, this program called Digital, uh, which is a digital logic simulator uh, similar to things like Logisim. Uh, I, in fact, originally started with Logisim. I uh, used it for a couple of years. Um, however, I did outgrow its functionality and uh, and unfortunately it has not seen an update since uh, 2013 so I, I did have to find uh, alternatives now there have been some uh, some logisim um, not not really descendants per se because the uh, the developer did not release the code but uh, th there have been some some attempts at recreating it uh, in a more modern setting but uh, they all kind of fell short in my in my usage uh, but I did stumble this year across this program, Digital, um, which is an open source project uh, by H. Neiman, which is here on GitHub. Uh, of course, because it's open source, if you um, want to play around with the code, you want to look at the code, you just want to compile it yourself, um, you can go ahead and download the code, um, you know, clone it to um, your own personal GitHub. Um, <clears throat> however, we're going to focus on the easy parts today. Got a couple of quick screenshots. And uh, when we open mine, you're gonna notice it looks a little different. Uh, my my eyes don't really care for these bright white backgrounds, so so I, I had to change that. Um, doesn't change the functionality. Um, you're probably seeing some things on here right now, like hey, what what are these? I'm seeing truth tables. I'm seeing K maps. We're gonna get to that. So um, anyway, no installation required. Uh, super easy. You're just gonna download the file, unpack it somewhere, you know, f into a folder, and run it now if you're on linux or mac um, no problem instead of a, an executable you can just run the jar file directly um, there's a linux shell script that's included um, if you are not able to run the jar file directly um, it uh, is worth mentioning you do need a java runtime environment jre at least eight in order to run this now if you've worked with java programming before um, or if you've run uh, Logisim before, you've already got this, but if you don't uh, and you don't want to go through um, the difficulties of getting the official JRE through, I believe, Oracle, you can use this uh, Adopt Open JDK. Now, I'm not going to go through the uh, installation process of that here. Um, I assure you, however, it is incredibly straightforward. Um, so if you do need a JRE uh, to get started, I recommend this one, or you can get the official um, Java through, uh, again, I do believe Oracle is who owns those uh, owns Java now. So uh, down below, of course, uh, we, all these features, uh, I'm not gonna be able to cover even even really a fraction of this. This, uh, this can do a lot. <laughs> um, however, there's extensive documentation available in a number of languages. Uh, the documentation is also included in PDF form in the download. As well, there is an extensive um, in-application help system, a lot of dialogues and context menus, uh, sorry, contextual clues, uh, context menus, yes, uh, tooltips. And, and as I said, the help pages themselves are uh, amazingly helpful. Um, and, and, and really, uh, once you get playing around with this, you'll... Uh, You'll find that it's very intuitive. Uh, anyway, so we're going to, you know, just, I've already got this installed just as an example. We're going to download this. We're going to open it up in your preferred, uh, you know, unpacker of choice and just dump the folder somewhere where you can access it and run that executable. Actually, have to. run from the executable sorry uh, you can run the jar file directly um, really the executable is just a loader um, however there is the option if you for some reason cannot run um, cannot get this to run uh, with direct 3d enabled some issue with video card drivers perhaps there is the option of running it without direct 3d uh, and, you know, mentioned there is the shell script for Linux and you know there's some some readme um, as I mentioned before the documentation is included right here and so let's see moving on we're going to go ahead and open digital which I already have open let's <laughs> clear the board <clears throat> so um, let's see 
on the left we've got our component tool or our components of course the gates you're already familiar with but a lot lot more there's outputs leds inputs we're going to talk about what a uh, a handful of these things do um and as i mentioned before there's tool tips that will give you clues for just about everything um, but yeah there is a lot of componentry in this uh, it's very flexible um, let's uh, let's just have a peek through now we're gonna we're gonna maybe get into some of these but uh, here is the uh, here's one of the focuses that we're, we're worried about today is we're going to be working with memory uh, specifically some RAM All sorts of settings options now what I like is that you don't have to change your global settings every time you can set certain things like this specific to each circuit you can create a generic circuit which is to say uh, much like creating a generic class in a programming language um, you can create a generic circuit that you can then use over and over and over again in other projects um, very very powerful little program here Now, I mean, obviously, I, I don't even know what all of these things do yet. I, I only use, uh, you know, a good fraction of this. Um, this is another feature that's really fun, however, is if you have a specific formatting you like to use for, for denoting how the logic is, is, is notated, you can select that here. Uh, I'm going to leave it with uh, the default, but um, you'll notice when I go to type these in later, I do actually use uh, more of a, a C++ programming style, and that's just a force of habit. That's how my brain works. Uh, it, it really just prefers that. And here we are, our global settings. Uh, chain, tried to tried that red green colorblind. Uh, I figured I, I am red green colorblind. It might help, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's got that bright background, and and that's just gonna gonna kill my eyes. So moving on, let's see. First thing we're gonna probably want to do. Well, we can place a few components, just kind of see how this works. And LED for an output. Now, um, difference, uh, there's some differences here, obviously, between how this functions in Logisim. One of my personal favorites is the ability to, you click, click, and you, you can set your wire down in segments, and you, you don't, whereas in Logisim, you were pretty much uh, restricted to, you had to uh, draw the line while holding down the mouse. And now, um, if you're working from a, a laptop with a touchpad, uh, like I was often doing um, a few semesters back, uh, it quickly becomes a real pain. So uh, this is, is, is super handy. Um, now, again, if you're familiar with Logisim, you might already be thinking, where's the properties panel, the attributes panel um, that we'd normally you would see on the, the bottom left there? Uh, we're going to get into that, but um, every single component that has, well, uh, pretty much every single component, but if it has properties you can edit, uh, you can right click to do so. Now, this is another important thing. Um, in Logisim, the simulation is always running. Uh, whether or not you have the clock ticking enabled is, is of course, uh, another situation altogether. But the simulation is always running. In digital, you actually have to tell it to start simulating the circuit. And this, this kind of can help to um, kind of find problems uh, before, before you get too deep. As you may have noticed uh, just now, when I tried turning that on, it had two outputs trying to feed to, to the same wire, and electrically speaking, that would not have worked. So that's why we separated that out. We got uh, two separate LEDs now. You know, nice demonstration of those gates in, in action. Let's, uh, let's see, what, what do we, we want to move on to next? Ah, uh, this, this is fun. 
So this isn't going to do anything. Yeah, we have nothing to analyze yet, right? It's a, it's a blank circuit. But synthesis. We can make a circuit by building a truth table. And if you're just learning digital logic or if you're wanting to see a visualization of something out of a textbook, this is invaluable. Um, I absolutely love this. Now, you can... Yeah, we created the circuit. You, you can, in addition to this... Um, now, we're, we're going to go into a little bit more of this, but uh, we build the circuit. Look at that. Bam. No problem. And that, that's just from a truth table. Uh, moving to the next part, though, the, uh, that really, really, uh, oop, did it again, that, that I really find to be the most useful is expressions. And here's going to be a great opportunity to show you the built-in help dialogues uh, and how useful they are. Uh, right here, this gives you all the syntax, all the information you're going to need to really put this expressions window um, to, to, to best use shows you the various types of logic uh, operators that it will accept uh, and just you know basic as i said syntactical um, information so i'm going to leave that open and uh, we're going to go ahead and try something out let's see uh, type something in here I was hoping I might find uh, an example from one of the earlier assignments for um, my uh, assembly language and computer architecture class, uh, the same class that most of the audience for this video is currently taking. Uh, couldn't, um, in any kind of quick fashion, find it and uh, didn't want to have to spend uh, hours in video editing dealing with this later. So we're just going to make this up as we go. Um, as, as I mentioned before, you'll notice that I'm typing um, with uh, the logical operators that you would use in, in a programming language like C++. Uh, it's, it just works better for me. You know, the, the double ampersand for and, the, the double um, pipe for or. Um, I do end up using the caret symbol um, for the Zor simply because... Uh, because I, I, I'll be honest, I don't believe I know the proper operator to, um, to do that in C++. <laughs> uh, I guess full disclosure, I am not in any way um, licensed or qualified to teach. So, uh, and in fairness, my grades are not great. So, you know, take take my advice at your own risk. But moving on, let's uh, let's create this thing and see what happens. Look at that. We're going to play around with how this works. And um, and then we're going to get into uh, another part of this program that I find just especially useful um, when you're trying to wrap your head around some of these concepts early on. Um, but, you know, first let, I'm just going to play with this. so far I mean everything seems to hold true from the way it was designed in a moment we're going to take a look at the truth table for it because uh, now that we have a circuit we can run that analysis tool make sure we stop our simulation bam all right so here is the truth table and not just the truth table but it breaks it down into a um, I suppose mostly simplified uh, I don't know about simplified, but uh, unsimplified, I suppose, is more accurate um, version of that same expression. It gives us all of our truth table information. Now, also, you can create these truth tables with as many variables as you need. You can, you know, boilerplate it with combination, combinatorial or sequential circuits, and then start from there. Um, we're not going to be able to use uh, this feature right yet. We can't bring up a K-map because um, it is limited in how many variables that it is able to K-map. Um, I believe it is four variables, and, and in a few minutes we're going to uh, wipe out uh, some of the extra stuff in here and, um, 
and I'm going to demonstrate the, uh, the KMAP generation and not just generation. So much like you can generate a circuit from a truth table where you can then manipulate the circuit that you've created by manipulating the truth table. Uh, the same is going to be true when we pull up the KMAP. Uh, once we have a circuit that can be KMAPed, uh, would would help if I change the expression so that <laughs> we have fewer variables. Uh, let, let's try that again. Um, <clears throat> once you, you have uh, the KMAP or the truth table pulled up, you can start changing the values um, to you know manipulate the expression, which it's going to show you again these the expression uh, in a few different forms and it's going to start allowing you to manipulate the circuit um, that way so let's let's have a look at that all right so um, and again if you're just learning K maps and you're having some trouble with how it goes together I highly recommend taking the examples um, out of out of your text or even just find some examples online and plug in what what they give you they might give you an expression they might give you uh, the truth table you know they might give you a diagram plug that into digital and then explore it you know analyze it uh, check out the truth table look at the kmap uh, once you've kind of got the hang of that you can start you know plugging in basically creating doing it the uh, the reverse way sorry you ba you know build it from a truth table build it from a kmap and then you yeah, we, we, we're gonna we're kind of working both ways here. So um, the main purpose of this video was uh, this most recent homework assignment in in this class has been for uh, building a RAM circuit that can um, uh, sorry w w with registers sorry that will uh, take an address and data uh, store. Uh, decimal information like a decimal integer placed into the input uh, will then store that in the specified address in RAM and then retrieve that um, from the from that address and output it to uh, the data output register and so we're gonna go through and build uh, an example of that uh, right now now the example that I build um, won't exactly work to complete the assignment and this is intentional I I, uh, I would feel a little I, I don't know I would I would not feel right uh, essentially doing the entire assignment um, for you but um, it, it's going to more or less be the same process but you're gonna have to play around with you know your your number of bits uh, to accommodate uh, to accommodate you know how many bits you're going to need for an address um, what I can tell you is if, if you're being given an address and the address is in a decimal integer say 61 um, what you need to think of is how many bits do I need in order to be able to store in binary the representation of that number and just thinking about that that should give you um, what you need to know to figure out you know how many how many bits you're gonna need for your addressing and, th and the same is gonna be true for your data how many bits are you going to need to store the integer that you're trying to store in your data um, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna be honest with you I, I um, I'm doing this voiceover after the fact and uh, I, I do not know why I bothered typing in these descriptions while I was doing it um, <laughs> but uh, they're, they're there anyway so we're gonna, we're gonna go through um, building the rest of this circuit I haven't really been talking um, about what I've been building as I've, do, as I've done it um, but we'll, we'll go over it in, in detail now as I mentioned before right clicking is how you're going to uh, get into all of your attributes and all of your uh, editing <clears throat> pardon me so um, and of course, each each object that you know is able to input or output bits, you know, it has a width. So you're, here's where we're setting our, our bit width for our address register, and we're going to give it a name. Let 
And of course, we're going to need our data input register. And in this case, I'm just going to make it 8 bits. So I guess technically, um, what, we're, what we're building here is going to be a 12-bit a uh, storage system, I, I guess. You know, 4 bits uh, reserved for addressing and 8 bits for storage. Um, and as such, uh, at least the way I, I'm i building this and uh, the way I'm demonstrating it, it's I did not put in anything that would uh, be able to handle signed integers. So for, for the purposes of this demonstration, we're working uh, purely with unsigned integers. All right, we're going to start wiring these things up. Of course, our data needs to go to the data input pin on our data in register, address to the data in on the address register. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> so, of course, um, you may have noticed these enable pins on the registers. Now, um, I, I, I don't remember if I tool tip these, but um, if those pins are not powered, if they're not receiving a one, if they're not getting a signal, uh, nothing happens to the registers doesn't matter when the, if the clock's pulsing or or what else is happening if data is being fed into the data line nothing happens until that enable pin gets set to one gets power uh, so that is why we're heading that push button there I'm trying to line this up so on the ram we've got uh, going from top to bottom uh, on the left, we have address, data in, store, clock, and load. Now, for the purposes of working with RAM, store, much like it sounds like, is, is an action that stores information in RAM. And load, though we often use that um, to mean the same thing as store, in this case is, is reading out. We're loading from RAM. So... You'll notice we hooked up a, a separate push button to store and a separate push button to load, and uh, we're going we're gonna to get into the 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 whys, the specific whys of that uh, momentarily. But let's get everything hooked up. Our data in comes from our data register, address in from the address register. All right, we've got our clock hooked up to everything. Now, um, of course, we can change our clock speed. Some of the more fun things about uh, this program also is you can specify certain components to to basically be components in an external um, development environment. So, uh, for example, the RAM can be, uh, when you simulate it, can be simulated as a ROM that can then be accessed from uh, another program or another, as I said, another development environment. Um, I have not played with this yet, but the functionality is there. Um, there are a number of libraries available for this also that I have not played with yet that includes a lot of logic chips and uh, and microcontroller stuff which I'm looking forward to playing with because uh, one, of, one of the things I do uh, outside of writing code and taking classes with all of you wonderful people is the is I, I play around with Arduinos and uh, some automation stuff just just electronics in general and so so this um, getting introduced to logic simulation uh, a few years ago in in another uh, class um, somewhat similar to this uh, has been a real game changer in the the things that used to just be hobbies that now could uh, combined with these new things I'm being educated on um, could become part of my uh, not just hobbies you know something that I'm doing as part of my uh, my living so hey we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens but uh, so now on the uh, the bottom part here you're gonna notice that I I um, I coupled the, the, the load from RAM um, push button to both the the load pin on the RAM and the enable pin on the output register and that's you know just just to save us uh, a step save us a button push because <clears throat> we're, we're really we're only going to need to enable that that data output register 
when we need to load it with data and we're only going to need to do that when we're loading it from RAM so essentially might as well make that one action um, we're gonna go ahead and change these number formats as well just to, to, to decimal to make it easier to read um, but you can uh, as, as you saw um, set set these to display in you know your preferred number format So let's run this and see what we can see. Now there's our clock pulsing. I believe I have it set to two hertz, so it's just twice a second. Everything seems to be wired up. We're gonna tool tip some of these bars. Now right now you see none of them are showing anything. Now when we, when we drag down, and we have to move around, it doesn't update live, but as you move down the powered clock wire, you see it changing from zero to one, zero to one, zero to one. Um, so the, when you tool tip the wire, it does give you know show you the current uh, state the current output here is the contents of our RAM now unlike Logisim we don't see it on the chip we don't have the ability to change it before the simulation has been enabled um, but once it's running we can pull it up and as we see right now it's uh, it's four bit addressing so we have 16 address spaces they're all empty uh, I'm gonna plug in some values into a few of these spots just to demonstrate um, reading out from RAM before we uh, before we even get into trying to, uh, to to stick some new information in there. So I'll just plug in some random numbers. None of these really have any significance, so I'm not really sure why I put so much thought into doing them. But bear with me. I'm I'm watching this too. I believe that one I did have the the purpose of putting it in because it is the maximum integer that can be uh, stored and represented in 8 bits but otherwise yeah there, there wasn't really a whole lot of thought that went into this we're just throwing in random numbers to, to demonstrate so let's let's give this a try first thing we want to do is come up here yeah, I must have set these to, to not not change them to decimal we're gonna we're gonna fix that next uh, next time I run the simulation but for now so address 15 we're going to load that into the register. Now, right now, the input, you know, see the input's putting out the hex of 15F, but the register itself is still not outputting anything because we haven't loaded it yet. Now, when we hit that enable pin and the clock pulses, it loads. Very important that the clock has to pulse while the enable pin is running. So if you if, if you want to be able to just click these buttons very fast, make sure you set your clock speed to something a little faster than the two hertz that I set. I, uh, I wanted the animation to be smooth, so I kept it very low. Now you'll see when we um, read that address of 15, we hit load from RAM, and bam, it loaded the information from address 15 in. At this point, I honestly don't know what. Oh, that's what I was doing. Yes. So here's a fun, fun, fun thing that a lot of people don't know about the Windows calculator. It's got other modes. And this one you're going to love, especially if you are a programmer or you have to take any classes like these. You can switch between hex, decimal, binary, and octal with a click and instantly know if you're if if you if basically uh you you did your math right because uh you know let's 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 pretend that we're all doing this on paper and showing our work the right way and you know and and, and let's not pretend because uh at least in the case of this class uh we have to or we're not getting credit so make sure to show your work know that you know how to do this on paper but once you do that calculator is going to save you so much time um yeah, I I, uh, I I am continually amused by um, just how mind blowing uh, many people find it when I, I tell them about that Windows calculator uh, feature. So anyway, we've changed everything to display in decimal. This should make things a little a little easier on us. I'm not going to bother preloading values this time. We're just going to drop something in here. All right, address space twelve. Now and you can you can go ahead and still put an in index here in, in hex and in, in binary however you are most comfortable putting in your information let's put some data in here we load our registers see our lines hit up now that 
is probably a setting I didn't look that hard for it that will switch it so that your your lines will show the output in in something other than hex but again by default it's going to show it in hex now we uh, we have no information in there yet but we load it and now we do or sorry we store it store it mixing up my own terminal or the terminology after I just said no, that we're, we're, we're not going to do that apologies all right, we're just going to go through a few more quick examples of this. And, and what I'm hoping is, while this didn't show you exactly how that homework question um, needs to be solved, it, it, it essentially did. It gave you all of the tools that you will need to, to solve that. Um, there is a second half to that homework um, involving building a 3-bit counter using only D flip-flops. Uh, well, it did not come to think of it. It did not specify only D flip-flops, but it said using D flip-flops, and it gave uh, information on the logic uh, that, that makes it work. Um, I cannot give a demonstration on that live without simply giving the answer away. Um, what I the, the closest I can come is I can say this look at the logic that is given uh, in the in the uh, the problem uh, where it tells you, you know, d1 equals d2 equals looking at that logic and at least the way I solved it using the the the, the Q and not Q outputs of the flip-flops and a couple of our basic logic gates build it pretty much the way it's written on paper and I think you will be pleased with the results um, I really hope that this video has been helpful I've uh, not really done anything like this before but uh, I hope it helps and you all have a great day and good luck